Okay, just uh, move Mr. Reed's mug out of the way before we start. Okay, so we're looking at probability today, and there's these three questions, the last of which I'm hoping you've seen is a bit different to the other two. It's pretty straightforward to answer the question here. Probability of flipping a coin and getting a tails, well obviously we know that that's going to be one out of two. Probability of choosing an ace of spades from a pack of playing cards, well, there's only one of those in the whole deck and there's 52 in total, so we say it's one out of 52. These two are pretty easy because they're very predictable events. We know what happens to coins, we know what happens to cards. But a drawing pin, well, it's not really designed to be predictable, it's designed to stick stuff on a wall. So it's much harder to answer the question, what is the probability of throwing a drawing pin and it landing point up? We've got to do a different sort of thing if we're going to answer this question. So initially, we can just maybe look at a drawing pin. And by the way, if you haven't got a drawing pin, you can do this experiment with something similar. Anything where you can't predict what it's going to do when it lands. So you can be creative and come up with something else if you want to use a different object. But initially, we can maybe just try and have a guess. Looking at it, it looks pretty heavy on the bottom, so maybe it's more likely to land there. But then again, it seems to want to balance over on its point, so I'm not really sure. But initially, I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be impossible to land point side up. So I'm going to cross that description out, and I'm also quite sure it's not certain to land point side up. So if I'm looking at that, hmm, maybe. Maybe I'm going to say it's unlikely, but that is really just a guess at this point. Looking at the numbers, I, I'm not going to say that it's zero because that is impossible. And we use the number one to describe probabilities in maths that are certain, so again, I'm going to eliminate that. And we've got every possible option between zero and one, and I'm thinking it's going to be in this kind of region here, probably about 0 0.3, which would be equivalent to a 30% or 3 out of 10 chance. But I've been saying so far that I'm just guessing and we can do something to be a little more sure. So what I've done and what I want you to do as well is an experiment. So get your drawing pin uh, or whatever it is you're using and in this case I'm going to throw this up in the air 50 times and record in this tally chart exactly what happens. So I've done that already by doing this sort of thing here. Every time it lands I decide to mark off on the chart what the result was and here's what I've got. So 13 times it landed point up and a lot more, 37 times it landed point down. Now when you've got this you can produce something called a relative frequency which is basically just a fraction that says, oh, that's the bell, that says how likely things are to happen out of the total number of times you did the experiment. So in this case, point up, well, it was 13 times out of 50. And sometimes you can simplify that, but in this case we can't because 13 is a prime number. Point down, it was 37 again out of 50. So I've now got some probabilities for this specific event. Just in the same way you would have the probability of one out of two for a coin, this time we had to do an experiment to get there, but now we do. And this is called a relative frequency. So, I'm hoping you've made this note here. In general, relative frequency is the number of successes, which doesn't necessarily mean a good thing, it just means a thing that we're looking for. So if we're looking for how many times it lands point up, we will call that a success. Although in this case it's not really a good thing, because you don't want to stand on that but we're going to call it a success because it's what we're trying to test. And that's out of the total number of trials, which just means the experiments. And it can be a fraction, decimal, or percentage. So you can use this to do predictions for what might happen if you continued doing your experiments. So I know that my point up relative frequency was 13 out of 50. So I can predict what's going to happen if I do it 100 times. Well, if that's what happens 50 times, it's probably just going to be double that if I do it 100 times. So I think I'll just do 13 out of 50. 
and then if I make an equivalent fraction over 100, I can see that all I've got to do is double the numbers and I'll get my answer. So it's going to be 26. I'll do the same thing for 200. If I could just double that again, because if that's the 100, I'll double that again and I'll get my 200, which in this case is going to be 52. Now your numbers will be different because you've got a different drawing pin, different experiment, maybe a different object. 500 would be done in a similar way. I could just multiply this one by 5. This one is obviously more tricky, but if we set the same sort of equation up, if I know that it happened 13 out of 50 times, I just want to know how many times out of 732 it would happen. Well, if I'm trying to work out this unknown term here, all I've really got to do is multiply this by 732. So if I do that, I end up with this calculation here. Now I'll give my calculator out to actually do that, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, that's a poor quality calculator. This one looks a bit better. So I'll just go 13 over 50 times 732, which is the number of times that I want to know how, uh, from this one. And this is 192.32. So I, in this case, I'll probably round that off to 192. So I'd expect about 192 times for this drawing pin to land point up. Now this is the key formula actually, because in general what we've done here is we've taken the relative frequency, in other words, this probability here, multiplied it by the number of trials that we're actually doing in this specific, specific situation here, not Pacific, don't say that. And that will tell you what we call the expected outcome or the expectation. And there's a, a clearer description of this on the next slide in the lesson. This is a very, very important formula. Now you can use this idea to answer a lot of questions and there's some more of those in the later part of the lesson. So go and have a look at those now.